I am really, and I told him this earlier when I met him, very excited to introduce and have the privilege to introduce Colonel Robert Springer, um, military pilot, shuttle astronaut, American hero. Colonel Springer is a veteran of both NASA and the United States Marine Corps. He was a military pilot, serving two tours of duty in Vietnam. He's been a test pilot, he was a test pilot over, uh, for many, many years. And in 1980, after many years of flying and after his combat duty, uh, clearly decided that he needed excitement in his life at that point, <laughs> and he was, uh, uh, was selected to be an astronaut in NASA. His first mission was in March 13, 1989, aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. He traveled to space again in 1990 on the Space Shuttle Atlantis, in what is as in your program, and I was so intrigued to read this, in what was a Defense Department classified mission, so we don't get to ask. But nonetheless, oh, um, it's ask. incredible. <laughs> he is part of a very exclusive club, and we're so happy to have him. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Robert Spring. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, and again, I really appreciate the uh, the warm uh, warm welcome. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Astronaut uh, may be the greatest uh, one-word uh, title that's uh, that's out there, and uh, I was certainly reminded of that uh, when I decided to, uh, after ten years with NASA, to go ahead and, uh, as my father said, uh, finally you know, get make an honest uh, living someplace along the line. As uh, I was interviewing with a variety of uh, of uh, CEOs from uh, the commercial companies I was applying to, and the first question I always got asked is, "Why are you leaving the best job in the world?" Uh, it's just a matter of perspective on, uh, on uh, how you do it. There's some of the things that, uh, that go with the astronaut program uh, that were not uh, readily apparent. So it was a, a fantastic opportunity, and, uh, and I'm certainly uh, proud to have had the opportunity to, uh, to do that, to fly twice in space. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I come from a uh, small town in Ohio, and I, I like to mention that because uh, on, on top of everything else, uh, the, the whole small town atmosphere, and I, I feel like having had a chance to, uh, to get through, through the community a little bit today and, uh, and visit the museum and, and see some of the things that are going on. Uh, certainly the same kind of an environment. Uh, the vast majority of astronauts who are selected are, are from small towns. And when I, I saw that, uh, that kind of statistic pop up, uh, I, I decided to do a little research on it and, and find out a little bit more about why would that be true. And, and I, I have to make sure that everybody understands that this is not exclusive. It, it, you don't have to have I come from a small town to have these attributes. But I, I chased it all the way back, and uh, it's actually mentioned in Tom Brokaw's book, uh, The Greatest Generation, if any of you ever read that. A fascinating story. And during World War II, they took a look at the people who had gone out on usually desperate missions. Uh, you know, we need to capture an enemy soldier, or we need to you know, get the message through, or something like that. And uh, in the vast majority of times, the people that were selected to do that uh, we're from small towns, and so they did a little bit more research and, and found out uh, why that was. And, and one of the nice things about coming from a small town, uh, you, you learn very, very early uh, in your life uh, a sense of accountability. I mean, uh, if, nothing, if nothing else, uh, when, if you live in a small town, in uh, one of my, the towns in Michigan I lived in, about 3,000 people, and you know, if you did something wrong, Somebody was going to notice it, and you were going to hear about it. So sometimes it was an enforced ac accountability, but, but uh, make no doubt about it. That, you know, and it was certainly uh, prevalent in my early education that, you know, if, whether it was my parents, my, my pastor, my teacher said, Bob, you need to go do something, boy, you did it. You didn't stop and, and get a Coke along the way or play baseball or something like that. You, you accomplished the mission, and, uh, and that, uh, that was something that I learned very early on. And I think, uh, again, referring back to uh, Tom Brokaw's book, uh, very, very prevalent in that. Now, again, I, I want to make sure I don't want to insult anybody from a big city because you, you can certainly develop those same kind of attributes in a variety of different scenarios. But I think it was uh, very, very important uh, in my upbringing, uh, again, from a small town environment, uh, to have that sense of accountability. And it was certainly uh, something that uh, stood me in, in very good stead for the, uh, my time that uh, I was uh, in the military as well as in the astronaut program. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I, didn't, uh, I, I was not a space geek when I was uh, growing up. I had uh, no uh, great interest in the, uh, in the program. Um, came from a, an interesting uh, family. Uh, my fa I'm the first one in my family to go to college. My father didn't complete high school, uh, but uh, both my mom and uh, dad uh, in, in, imbued in uh, my brothers and I a, a real sense of responsibility, accountability, and, and a, a, a sense of, uh, of trying to accomplish things. And uh, I was, uh, as I graduated from high school, uh, I was, had the opportunity 
Uh, very, very uh, out of the norm. I, I had, uh, had a, a, a uh, scholarship to uh, uh, a school to study petroleum engineering, and, and uh, along the way, somehow, I, I had uh, also applied for a Navy ROTC scholarship. And uh, through that, I got a call one night from our local congressman who, who said, uh, I understand you're interested in the career in the Navy. Uh, would you be interested in going to the Naval Academy? Uh, yes, sir, I would. Uh, that sounded like a good deal. Well, primarily, it's a free ride. You know, you, your whole, whole, uh, whole four years is paid for. And there were other kids in the family that needed to go to school. So I, I did that. And he said, well, here's the deal. I've already selected my candidate. And, uh, but I have a, uh, an open competition. And there's one more opportunity left to, to take the exam. And, and if you do better than my current candidate, I'll, uh, I'll make you my, uh, my uh, nominee from, uh, from this district in Ohio. Well, I, I applied to, to get in uh, to get the last exam, and, and uh, I didn't even find out until I had traveled to a distant town uh, in the state of Ohio and, and was waiting. I, they said that my uh, permission to take the entrance exam to the academy would arrive by telegram, and it did about 15 minutes before they closed the door. Took the exam, scored highest on it, and, uh, and ended up going through the academy. So, uh, and, and I'm bringing that story up because it, it is sort of typical of the events that happened uh, throughout my life, sometimes uh, serendipitous and, uh, and other times not. But uh, I graduated from the academy, took my uh, commission in the Marine Corps, actually went through the basic school at Quantico. Any Marines in the crowd, by the way? I always uh, I like to recognize my, uh, my fellow Marines. Uh, thank you so very much. And uh, I actually graduated as a platoon commander and, uh, uh, with an option to go into aviation. Of course, Vietnam was starting at that time, so I, uh, I opted to go ahead and, and start in, uh, in flight training and, uh, and get into uh, aviation. Got my wings in Pensacola, or in, uh, I started in Pensacola, Florida, got my wings in Beeville, Texas in uh, 1966, and, and uh, then started flying a variety of different type of uh, craft. Had a chance, um, a lot of hours in the F-4 Phantom. Uh, uh, flew uh, 300 combat missions in Vietnam in the, in the F-4. Uh, towards the end of my career, as uh, the new uh, F-18 was coming online, I actually had a chance to do some test flights in the, in the F-18. I had a chance, so one of the nice things about flying in the Marine Corps were a combined force of arms, a lot of different opportunities, and uh, they gave me the opportunity to uh, fly helicopters, uh, both Hueys and Cobras, and again, second tour in Vietnam, had a chance to, uh, to do some, some combat flying in that. And a very, very important part of the, uh, of the uh, education uh, the diversity is involved, so I like to say I've flown everything from jets to fighters to others. Uh, one of the uh, light aircraft I flew actually in Vietnam. Uh, they, they get points if anybody recognizes that airplane that's up there. It's the O-1 Bird Dog. Uh, we use it as an observation aircraft uh, uh, to spot enemy positions, and I've got a, a couple hundred hours in that as well. So a, a lot of uh, diversity, and it, it highlights some of the things that I like to do uh, uh, throughout my career, taking advantage of opportunities uh, as they came along. Uh, someplace along the line, I did uh, get a chance to go through the, uh, the Navy Top Gun school. And if, uh, how many have seen the movie Top Gun, by the way? Is that, oh, all right. I, I consider it a training film, so it's, uh, it, it's uh, <laughs> I do have to tell you one thing. Uh, guys, Kelly McGillis is not really an instructor there. And ladies, <laughs> Tom Cruise wasn't a Top Gun pilot either. But other than that, the, uh, the movie was pretty good. I always like to illustrate it because it, 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 it focuses on one of the things. And, and if you remember the movie, you basically set up to do the air-to-air -air combat. You've got two uh, uh, airplanes uh, coming at each other at a combined speed of somewhere over 1,000 miles per hour. And as you pass in close proximity, uh, the, the fight is on, and you're trying to maneuver to, to gain a, a, a tactical advantage on the other airplane. In training, it was just a, a competition course in combat. Uh, there's no points for second place, as they say. Uh, so you, uh, it was really very uh, important to develop a skill set that allows you to do rapid decision making. Again, think of these terms. You're flying at speeds excess of 1,000 miles an hour and, and trying to position your craft to, to gain a tactical advantage. And so a lot of times you have to make split second decisions. My favorite part of the movie, Top Gun, by the way, uh, was when uh, Maverick comes back from his, uh, his second mission. He's actually uh, won the, the fight, uh, but he committed some sort of an infraction. He's being chewed out by Kelly McGillis and, and, uh, as the instructor. And she says, Maverick, there are times when you just have to stop and think. And Maverick jumps out of his chair and says, no. There are times when you don't have time to stop and think. You have to rely on the training, uh, all the experience you've had, and, and whatever intuition it is to, to be able to gain the advantage. And how does that apply to the space program? Well, I'm talking about speeds here, uh, closure speeds of 1,000 miles per hour. Whether you realize it or not, when you lift off that 5 million pound spacecraft with 7 million pounds of thrust, in eight and a half minutes, you accelerate from zero 
to 17,500 miles per hour and travel 200 miles in space. And so again, that rapid decision-making process. Uh, they've even actually formalized it a bit. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Colonel John Boyd, who's an Air Force uh, pilot that uh, devised something called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A, Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And, and it's, it's like uh, other things, if anybody studies these leadership things, PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, that sort of acronym that, that gets you in. But he used it actually in the fighter pilot business uh, to be able to very, very rapidly gain a tactical advantage on, uh, on his, uh, his opponents. And uh, it is a, a process, again, to make the decision making, implement it. Uh, be careful, uh, actually, when I, I give lectures on, uh, on leadership and business management, I talk a little bit about the OODA loop. Um, and it, it, because it applies in the business world exactly the same way. Uh, uh, Bob, you'll, you'll think about this, you know, the, the process is the same. What you're trying to do, instead of a tactical advantage, you're trying to get a competitive advantage. And if you can bring your product to market faster than your, your a competitor can, uh, you're very likely to, uh, to gain a market advantage and, uh, and, and position yourself favorably. So the, the process is the same. The only thing you have to be careful in there, you don't get caught in what they call the ooh, 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 oh, 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 oh. Observe, orient, observe, orient, observe, orient never get around to deciding and acting. So a very, very important part, uh, you've got to, uh, to make sure you encompass that as well. So after uh, gaining some experience uh, flying jets, helicopters, uh, going through the Top Gun School as well as the uh, Navy Test Pilot School, uh, NASA opened up the uh, selection for uh, the shuttle astronauts in uh, late 1970s. And actually, uh, I was about 36 years old at the time, had absolutely no interest in, uh, in getting into the program. But I had a, a friend that uh, came over to my house and. Uh, I'd gone to graduate school with him, and he, uh, he said, uh, are you going to apply for the, for the uh, shuttle program? And I said, well, I really hadn't given it that much thought. And uh, he said, well, as it turns out, uh, you have all the criteria. And so he handed me the application. I filled it out, sent in, and got selected my first time around. Uh, I point that out. Uh, the vast majority of people who have applied for the astronaut program over years uh, generally uh, wanted, uh, they dream about it. It's something that they've planned on. My be best friend in the program, uh, he can tell you when he was five years old that uh, he wanted to be an astronaut. So he went to the right schools, got the right degrees. Uh, I think tried four or five times and finally got selected on the fifth try to, to be an astronaut. So again, one of those uh, you know, opportunities that, that came up. Uh, so I uh, applied for the, uh, uh, for the program. You can see there the, uh, the criteria. It hasn't changed much over time. Uh, of course, heavy reliance on technical background. As we go into the future programs, and although the shuttle program has ended, we're still selecting astronauts. In fact, we should see the next selection announced, I think, sometime uh, during this, uh, this calendar year. Uh, so the criteria haven't, uh, haven't changed much over time. Inside the astronaut office, by the way, we have a, uh, a kind of a joke about the perfect astronaut candidate. You have a PhD in astrophysics, 10,000 hours of flight time, and be 24 years old. If anybody meets that criteria, make sure you, uh, uh, you step up and, uh, and do that. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of challenges. Uh, the selection process uh, is, is, uh, is kind of unique in getting selected for the program. Uh, you make your application. Um, the year I applied, they had about uh, 10,000 applicants. So they down-selected to about 200. And then they brought you 20 at a time down to the Johnson Space Center. And you went through a week-long evaluation uh, process, uh, physical, mental, uh, psychological. Uh, some of it was kind of unique. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not ever sure whether this is part of the physical or psychological uh, testing. The, uh, the thing you see there in the background is something called the personal rescue sphere. And it was one of the things that NASA had come up with. And the scenario was you'd sent a shuttle up into space, uh, it had gotten stranded there, couldn't re-enter the atmosphere, so you had to send a rescue shuttle up. And uh, how would you transfer crew members from the, rescue sh from the damaged shuttle to the rescue shuttle? Well, uh, everybody says, well, use those spacesuits you got. Well, that's neat, but we have seven people on board and only two suits. So we had to come up with a, a, a solution to that. So the personal rescue sphere, basically a, a pressurized, uh, thermally stabilized, inflatable uh, thing that you could get inside. About, the, about a three-foot size uh, a beach ball that, uh, that you got into. I can see one of my classmates here not overly excited about the, uh, the test because they would, they would instrument you up so they could measure your pulse rate and, and uh, blood pressure and things like that. And then you, you had to scrunch down and get inside that three-foot ball. They zipped it closed, and if, you had, if somebody had claustrophobia, you knew in the first few seconds. Their, their pulse rate would just go uh, off scale high. It turns out, apparently, I wasn't claustrophobic because I did that particular test uh, right after uh, lunch, and uh, I actually started to doze off in the personal rescue sphere. So uh, I think they figured out pretty quickly that I, uh, I was, uh, was not claustrophobic, but uh, an important part of it, uh, uh, again, from a psychological standpoint. 
I like to show this, uh, this slide as kind of a cartoon uh, that I've, I've put together to, uh, to illustrate. Uh, you know, one, of, one of the things that uh, we learned early on in the, uh, in, the, in the program, and we were very fortunate, those that came in uh, during the shuttle era, we had people from the earlier programs. Uh, some of the Mercury, Jemmy, and Apollo guys were still around. And one of the first pieces of advice they gave us was don't read your own press clippings. I mean, whatever you do, leave your ego behind. And in general, I, I think that was very good advice. Uh, and, and for the most part, I think particularly those in the shuttle program certainly uh, uh, hearken to that. There are a few uh, astronauts, I never mentioned names Buzz, but there are a few uh, uh, people. <laughs> There are a few people out there who, uh, whose ego have, uh, have exceeded things, but it was, uh, it was, it was really good advice. Uh, it was also brought to my uh, further attention when I uh, reported to Houston, uh, bought a house there in the, uh, in the local uh, uh, Clear Lake area, and the house I bought was Jim Lovell's house. Jim Lovell, Apollo 13 commander. So if you saw the Apollo 13 movie, that's my house in the, uh, in the, in the movie. And then I later on actually was, uh, was asked to help consult on the, uh, uh, on the movie a little bit, so I had a, had a chance to do that. So very, very interesting. Anyway, I had moved into, uh, was moving into Jim Lovell's house, and one of the neighbors came from across the street and introduced himself and said, uh, well, um, who, you, who do you work for? And he says, well, I work for NASA. And he says, oh, that's great. He worked for NASA, too. And he says, well, what's your job? Well, now, this wasn't ego, but just a little bit of pride. I said, well, I'm in the new astronaut class. Rolled his eyes back and says, oh, geez, so we need another damn astronaut in the neighborhood. <laughs> that brings you back down to Earth uh, pretty quickly. So uh, uh, good advice. Uh, leave, leave your uh, ego behind. Uh, my class, uh, they, we had about 10,000 of supply. We finally winnowed it down to a, a smaller group. The final product, by the way, of that, that whole selection process, you, uh, uh, you went through a, uh, one of the most interesting job interviews I've ever done in my life. Uh, they bring you into a, a room uh, one at a time. They, uh, they down-selected about uh, 200 people, brought you to Houston 20 at a time. Uh, you went into a, an interview panel. They had a, like a semicircular table, and then you sat under one of these down lights. It was, like I said, more like an inquisition. And then they always started with one question. Starting with high school, tell us about yourself. And it was up to you. That was it. That's the question. Tell this panel, maybe up primarily of experienced astronauts and a few administrative uh, uh, people, uh, tell them what, uh, you know, what you thought you brought to the table that, uh, that would make you a, a good candidate. And they would then occasionally throw questions at you. And it became pretty apparent that they weren't really interested in so much how you, uh, what you answered for the question, but rather how you answered it. Uh, and, and again, just to illustrate, I, I feel very, very blessed throughout my, uh, my life and career to have had these uh, uh, kind of uh, moments of opportunity, uh, defining moments, if you will. Uh, so John Young, one of our most experienced astronauts, was on my interview panel, and, and uh, about a half an hour into the uh, interview, he said, uh, well, Colonel Springer, I see that uh, you spent a tour at uh, Patuxent River Naval Air Station, the test center. Uh, what can you tell this uh, panel about the gun gas burning problem on the F-14 airplane? Now, there's an esoteric topic for you. <laughs> What Captain Young didn't know is that had been one of my projects. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by education and, uh, and training, so I, I started into a, a very, very detailed discussion. Got about uh, uh, one minute into it. They didn't want to hear the answer. What they were trying to do was catch you off guard, see how, again, how you respond. And it, it harkens back to this decision-making process. When you're placed into a, a position, as you, as you will be eventually in the cockpit, how are, how are you going to respond to all that? So a uh, very, very uh, important part of that, uh, that making. The other defining moment for me uh, during that uh, interview week that we were there, they had a dinner uh, on Thursday night. Uh, they teed you up a little bit because they, uh, they serve cocktails, and, and I think it was a very, very deliberate ploy to get you to relax. And, and again, they had uh, a dozen or so experienced astronauts, some administrative officials, and uh, we sat down uh, for dinner. Um, and the legendary head of the Astronaut Selection Board, uh, George Abbey, uh, as we sat down for dinner, he, he put, turned on the microphone. He says, in a very, very droll voice, he said, uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there were, there were 20 of us there uh, from the select, possible selectees. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we get started, uh, one of your classmates, Colonel Springer, has something he'd like to say. And I'm sitting there just totally stunned. What the heck? Nobody's told me about a speech. <laughs> So they, they pass the microphone down to me, and as I'm getting to my feet, oh, by the way, sitting next to me is, is one of the experienced Marine Corps astronauts, uh, Colonel Jack Lausma was there, and as, as I was getting to my feet, it finally dawned on me. It was the Marine Corps birthday, November 10th. And so as I got to my feet, I said, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate all of you being here tonight to help celebrate uh, the 205th anniversary of the founding of our beloved Corps. And in circumstances like this, uh, we like to take the opportunity to introduce the youngest Marine present. I believe I fulfill that. Uh, and then introduce the oldest Marine president, Colonel Jack Lausman. I sat down, handed him the mic, <laughs> and got off the stage. So uh, 
and, and again, and I looked down at uh, Mr. Abbey and big smile. I, I truly believe that was the, uh, the moment I got selected for the program. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not kidding about that. I, I really think that's the case. Uh, 19 of us, well, 21 total in the, in the class. So uh, uh, two ESA astronauts, uh, two women in our class. A couple of people, if you, if you followed the program at all, uh, very, very young looking Charlie Bolin. He was just uh, retired as the NASA administrator. Uh, Franklin uh, Chang Diaz, uh, originally from Costa Rica, and Jerry Ross are the uh, only two astronauts who have flown seven times in space. Uh, interesting. Um, also on this, uh, Mike Smith, uh, who is the pilot of Challenger. Uh, so very, very interesting, and a very, very young looking Robert over there on the, uh, on the bottom of the page. Once we start to uh, get selected for the program, we, uh, we start some uh, training. And because not all of us came from the military, uh, we did a lot of team building exercises uh, up there in the north woods of Canada, again, putting in into, uh, opportunities where you deprived of sleep and food and warm clothing and things like that. And again, learn a, a bit about the uh, uh, team building. And then uh, for, those, for those that had never been in the military, there's some things that, uh, because we would be flying jet airplanes as well as, uh, as the space shuttle, uh, uh, some interesting training opportunities. Virtual reality, uh, a breakthrough in, uh, in the training, a low cost way of, of providing some very, very realistic training. And of course, happy for me because uh, by that time uh, uh, I had uh, about 17 years in the Marine Corps. I was a full colonel. My next, next job uh, for the uh, foreseeable future as a colonel, I probably would have been flying a desk as much, and we still got to fly those neat little uh, T-38 airplanes, uh, kind of the sports car of the, uh, the airplane world, and uh, so kept, uh, kept flying in that uh, nice picture here as you pass over uh, the shuttle on the launch pad. One of the more unique things we uh, did, uh, learning to uh, adapt to the weightless conditions of space. Uh, we call it zero gravity. It's not really zero gravity. Uh, gravity is present in what you're in is constant free fall. And one way you train for that is go out and we use a, a, a KC-135. It's a military version of a Boeing 707. We go out and we fly a, ser a series of uh, parabolic arcs. And so you pick up some airspeed, you do a 2G pull up, and then you push over the top of that arc. And during that uh, period of time, it can be as long as 90 seconds, you're actually free floating over the top and you get 90 seconds of true weightless conditions. It's, uh, you're just as weightless there as you, as you will be uh, in space. Uh, uh, the kids are probably a little bit young to, uh, to talk about the, the whole theory of it, but it's, uh, it, it's very, very uh, excellent training. Uh, some of it's just fun, uh, but, uh, uh, but some of the times we did do in there, 90 seconds may not sound like uh, much time, but you do a part tax. So uh, on, on one of the parabolas, you might put on the bottom half of the spacesuit. On the next parabola, you do the top half, and, or, or practice setting up experiments 90 seconds of time. Of course, on every one of those parabolas, uh, once you ran out of airspeed, you had to dive back down, 2G pull up at the end. Uh, I just, anybody know the nickname for that airplane, by the way? I, I called it a KC-135. We fondly called it the Vomit Comet. Uh, <laughs> It, it earned its name, uh, honestly, uh, and it wasn't so much the zero gravity, it was the 2G pullout at the bottom that, uh, that made the difference. Uh, there's a commercial company out there, by the way, that, uh, that sells rides on a similar aircraft. I used to consult with them, and, and we'd get uh, people come in. Uh, I think the, the fee at the time was about uh, $5,000 for a two and a half hour flight, and they'd, they'd do 16, 18 parabolas. And I'd give them a briefing and tell them about some of the things uh, about the zero gravity. And then one of the last things I'd do is, now I'm gonna recommend you take an anti-motion sickness drug. Oh, no, I want to experience everything. Like, oh, you don't. <laughs> you really don't want to get sick up there. It's, uh, it's no fun at all. So after some uh, preliminary training, uh, a little over a year, uh, we, uh, we, we were, quote, graduated. They officially designed, defined us as uh, astronauts. We got silver astronaut wings. And my, uh, my standing joke about that, those silver wings and $1.89 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It, uh, it was really just the, uh, the beginning. Uh, so uh, as, the, uh, as we're uh, moving into the, the beginning of the program, uh, shuttle was on the drawing boards. And, and this, is, uh, this is actually just a, uh, an artist concept, of, but this is what we thought the shuttle was going to do in the, uh, uh, in the early 1970s. It was going to be the first uh, world's only uh, reusable spacecraft. It was going to launch like a rocket, fly in space like a spaceship, come back and land like a conventional airplane. We're going to have a fleet of four such vehicles. Each one of those vehicles was going to fly six times a year. That would be 24 flights a year. And so it was going to be an airliner type operation. And you can see simplicity in itself. Uh, you'd come back after a flight, shuttle would be pulled into the, uh, the hangar, you'd have a handful of people working on it, uh, drop a new payload in, uh, fill it up with gas, and then shoot off again. Naive concept. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's not exactly the way it worked. Uh, this, this, is, this is a picture. This is not an artist concept. Uh, you, you may have trouble finding the shuttle. This is the nose of the shuttle uh, uh, right here in the center. What's all the rest of it? This is what it took to maintain that shuttle. 
Uh, 24 flights a year, our best year ever was eight flights. We did it one time, eight flights in one year. Incredible complexity, two and a half million parts. Uh, and, and you basically had to almost rebuild uh, uh, the vehicle every time you flew it in space. When we really got good at it, we could turn the vehicles around in somewhere just under 90 days. So incredible uh, complexity that, uh, that, that went into that. Now, I like to show this particularly when I'm talking to a, a bunch of engineering students because they'll say, now I'm going to tell you about every one of those systems. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, it would be fun, actually, but give you some idea of the, uh, the three basic parts of the shuttle. Uh, in the background, the big external tank, that tank uh, held uh, 550,000 gallons of fuel. We fed that fuel into the shuttle main engines at, at 1,000 gallons a second. Now, I, you know, I'm throwing around big numbers, and, and, uh, and I, as an engineer, I love this stuff, so it's, it's really fun for me to do that. But let me put that in a, a bit of an Earth-based perspective. 1,000 gallons a second. You realize if you've got a standard backyard swimming pool, 20,000 gallon pool, I empty your swimming pool in under half a minute at that kind of flow rate. Uh, the tank was the only part of the system that was not reusable. Uh, we carried that to the edge of space. We jettisoned it, and it burned up as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, on either side, the solid rocket boosters, and despite the fact that that was the, uh, the cause of the uh, loss of Challenger and her crew, uh, incredibly uh, uh, powerful. Uh, when you lift off, uh, again, a five million pound craft with seven million pounds of force, uh, you're clearing the launch tower, uh, accelerating at three times the force of gravity, 100 miles per hour as you clear the top of the launch tower. Those, those provide most of the thrust. The shuttle main engines, about 1.2 million pounds of thrust. If you want to convert that, that's 37 million horsepower, by the way, just in case anybody's interested. Uh, solid rocket boosters, uh, total between the two, almost six million pounds of thrust. So incredibly uh, uh, dynamic ride. The, the, uh, the, the solid rocket boosters re were reusable. Uh, they exhausted their fuel two minutes and 10 seconds into the flight. We jettisoned them off. They fell in the ocean. We picked them up. Uh, and then we, um... okay, let me see. Where, where would the OK button be? Let's just, let's just try that. Yeah. Yeah. That went, went back a minute. Let me. Well, we'll, we'll kind of work with that. If somebody can grab one of the people who really know what they're doing here tonight, uh, we can uh, get that, uh, that taken care of. I, well, oh, there it is. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to. Uh, You think that'll do it? Should I hit the X or wait for you to? Uh, yeah, just put, yeah, hit the X or cancel. Yeah, that, that is easier said than done at this point. Ah. Yeah. Come on, it's not rocket science. <laughs> You're going to get an invitation in just a minute. Back to the engineering, I, I, can, I can do that. Uh, and then the, uh, um, the shuttle itself, uh, the part that we actually call the space shuttle, uh, about, uh, about the same size fuselage as a um, small 737, 60-foot uh, long payload bay, that's where we carried our classified cargo uh, in there and, uh, uh, and was a truly uh, reusable part of the, of the system. We had a lot of things. Uh, shuttle was unique. Uh, we never had an escape system designed into the uh, shuttle. And, and the reason why is, again, a, a bit of optimism that we thought we could uh, always do what we called an intact abort. So we had a lot of different scenarios. Basically says that if something went wrong, depending on what phase of the launch it went wrong, you could either recover back at the Kennedy Space Center, go to a, an abort site, uh, uh, Maroon, Spain, or actually uh, take it to orbit. Uh, the good news was throughout the, uh, the program, the only time we did that, we had one uh, engine failure, but we were able to actually take the, uh, the shuttle all the way to the orbit. For those that are uh, aerodynamic uh, fans in the uh, in this, uh, crowd, uh, bringing that uh, shuttle back for landing was, uh, was interesting. We did what we called approach and landing tests. 
put the shuttle on top of a specially configured uh, Boeing 747 uh, and then dropped it and did the first, first test of that uh, uh, or glided test. And of course, that's, uh, that's when we came back for land. You gotta remember, you got a big 220,000 pound glider. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the wings on that are very, very small compared to uh, a similar size airplane. So a lot of different things. Finally assigned to a crew in 1983, uh, my initial mission was, uh, was canceled. Uh, and so the, the we, crew stayed intact, assigned to a subsequent flight that would have flown in, in uh, March of uh, 1986. Uh, started training inside the, uh, the shuttle cockpit. Uh, and again, a big emphasis on, uh, on the coordination, the communication, the teamwork. Incredibly complex inside the cockpit. Most people don't realize it, but uh, during most of the mission, with the exception of the landing phase, the uh, shuttle is actually being flown by the computers. Uh, in today's environment, that's not bad, but uh, as I look around, I know there's more than one person in the room who remembers what computer technology was like in the mid-1970s. Anybody have a Commodore 64? <laughs> That was about the state of the art. That's what we had on board the uh, shuttle. And so the, the reason I point that out is uh, uh, the, the computer was doing the flying, all the other things, all the systems management, all the malfunctions. And again, you've got a vehicle that's got two and a half million parts inside the cockpit. Uh, some 3,000 switches and gauges uh, and displays. Uh, we did upgrade the cockpit. This is the one I trained and flew in, three computer screens. Uh, we upgraded that in the 1990s. They upgraded the computers, put in a total of nine uh, computer screens or multifunction displays, as NASA likes to call them. Kind of a good news, bad news. The good news was it gave us more information to work with. The bad news was it gave us more information to work with. It only got more complex inside the cockpit. But again, put this in the scenario. Uh, you're launching that uh, uh, five million pound craft with seven million pounds of uh, thrust, uh, something fails, you're accelerating at three times the force of gravity, and the hundreds and hundreds of hours, because you've got to know how to handle that systems, and we did it through something we called redundancy management, fancy way of saying we had backups. For our critical components, we actually had three levels of backup. So it could fail once, fail twice, still fly on the third backup system. But again, it was a responsibility of the crew to be able to identify that. And, uh, and we did, every, mis every mission we flew had, uh, had multiple failures on board. Uh, but again, hundreds and hundreds of hours of training, not only concentrating on the, uh, the technology in the cockpit, uh, but again, the teamwork. I got to do one of the more fascinating parts of, uh, of training for the flight. Uh, I was selected as a pilot, uh, but assigned to both of the crews as a mission specialist. The carrot they give you for that is you get to do the spacewalks. Probably the most physically demanding part of training for the program, uh, the suit that you see me getting into there weighs about 300 pounds. Why so complex? Well, you gotta remember, you're gonna go up in space, in my case, uh, exit the uh, space shuttle, go in the vacuum of space, uh, no air to breathe, uh, temperatures that range from plus uh, 200 to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, incredibly hostile environment. You're not only gonna survive for up to eight hours in that environment, but to, uh, but to do up to eight hours of useful work as well. So incredibly complex. We trained in what we called our neutral buoyancy laboratory, a big water tank using the neutral buoyancy of the water as a way to uh, simulate the effects of weightlessness. The interesting thing about that uh, in the neutral buoyancy tank, anybody who's ever been scuba diving uh, knows what I'm talking about that. You're neutrally buoyant, suit still weighs 300 pounds. And uh, it's very, very fatiguing. Again, uh, we train like we're going to fly. You're going to do an eight-hour spacewalk. You're going to spend eight hours in that uh, neutral buoyancy laboratory. If you don't believe me, jump in your backyard swimming pool with a 300-pound weight and drag it back and forth for uh, four or five hours. You'll understand what I'm talking about. We also uh, got to uh, practice landings, something we call the shuttle training aircraft. All of us uh, that, had, uh, that were uh, selected as pilots uh, got to do this uh, uh, training. And to really understand the uh, complexity associated with this, it's the one time that uh, as crew members we actually took over and flew the shuttle manually. Why didn't we use the autopilot? We could have, we never fully trusted it. And one of the reasons why is, again, when you're coming back from space, you have no fuel on board. So you're a big 220,000 pound glider. We're actually coming in for a landing seven times steeper and 10 times faster than a commercial airliner. So in a, when you land on a commercial airplane, coming down a fairly gentle three degree glide slope, descending about 1500 feet per minute rate of descent, landing about 140 miles per hour. Shuttle, 21 degree glide slope, 15,000 feet per minute rate of descent, landing about uh, 200 uh, uh, miles per hour. So incredibly more difficult and again, uh, no fuel on board, so a, a very, very difficult landing. We practiced that in what we called a shuttle, a training aircraft, a modified Gulf Stream II. Uh, we modified the cockpit so it had the same controls and displays. Now, how do you take that straight wing business jet, uh, my, my pilot over here, how do, you, how do you take that and make it fly that, uh, that dynamic approach? Well, we take it up to 30,000 feet. That's where we normally start to take over and, and fly the shuttle manually. You can see we put the main landing gear down. You notice the nose landing gear is not down because it can't handle the air loads. Put both engines in full reverse thrust, 
that increases the drag, allows you to fly that same 21 degree glide. So every commander who ever landed the vehicle, minimum of 1,000 approaches in the shuttle training aircraft in order to qualify. So a lot of, a lot of work that went into it. A lot of different types of training that we did. One of the more fascinating things, uh, this is our escape vehicle in case we had had a, uh, something happen to the pad and we could uh, uh, get away from the collapsing shuttle, jump in this uh, armored personnel carrier. I uh, actually got to drive that for a while, so kind of fun. Everything was going uh, real well, preparing for our uh, launch in uh, March of uh, 1986. Of course, as you probably all remember, January of 86, uh, we had the, ch uh, the Challenger accident, lost uh, Challenger and her crew. And of course, a tremendous uh, personal setback for all of us in the program, uh, a tremendous setback from, from the technology standpoint. And, uh, and yet, I don't know how many of you, I'm, I'm, it's one of those accidents when I talk about it, most people can say, I know where I was when, uh, when we lost Challenger and the crew. And it was, a, uh, it was not only a material failure, but it was something that we knew about. And uh, the, the real lesson that was learned out of that, uh, the whole Challenger accident, was the fact that uh, the management decision-making process was flawed. Uh, we'd been told by the contractor, uh, never, the, the solid rocket boosters had never been tested below 46 degrees Fahrenheit. On mo launch morning, it was 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The seals that were supposed to uh, expand and fill the void failed to expand. Uh, the hot uh, jet gas uh, came out and caused the collapse of the external tank and, and the eventual launch of Challenger. 30 months to uh, reconstitute that program uh, while uh, uh, we fixed not only the cause of the, of the accident, but uh, made over 200 major changes. Uh, just a quick picture, you can see uh, this little puff of smoke. Challenger was doomed, that was about a second after liftoff. Uh, Challenger was doomed at that point in time. Uh, we had these, um, uh, the original design allowed uh, hot gas to escape through that, uh, through that seal, and again, caused the loss of, uh, of Challenger and her crew. Uh, a lot of resolve that came out of that. Uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Theodore Roosevelt, uh, you just, uh, this, this business is no place for those who are, are timid spirits. And, uh, and I, I truly believe in this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I love that. Uh, it's, it's far better to, uh, uh, to, to uh, take the risk and, uh, and, and not live in that gray light, twilight that uh, knows neither uh, success or failure. Uh, so, and, and we certainly believe that in NASA as we reconstitute it. So 30 months, uh, the program was down. My crew stayed constituted, but we did a lot of different things. Uh, uh, worked in mission control uh, during that point in time. Also points out, uh, you know, one of the questions I often get asked, do you spend all your time in training? And the answer is no, you do a, a variety of uh, different type of jobs. Uh, one of mine uh, here in, in the uh, mission control, uh, uh, only one person in mission control actually talks to the crew on board the, uh, the craft. That's the, what we call CAPCOM. It's left over from the early days of capsule communicator. And, uh, and the reason for that is uh, in very, very important. And again, going back to those time constraints I talked about uh, at the speeds that we're doing things, uh, very, very precise, unambiguous communication. So the CAPCOM is always uh, an astronaut who has a fair amount of experience in it and, uh, and is able to uh, actually go through the process of, of explaining things to the crew and, and, and receiving the information. Information. Communication's a, a very, very important uh, part of it. Uh, you may have wondered, uh, for those of you that have, have worked with the military at any point in time, why the uh, military has so much trouble. Take the word secure. If, uh, if, if you were told to secure a building, the Navy would turn off the lights and lock it up. The Army would occupy the building so no one could enter. The Marines would assault it and capture it and defend it with small arms fire, and the Air Force would take out a three-year uh, lease with an option to buy. <laughs> Same communication, uh, un unintended consequences from, uh, from how, you, uh, how you do that. So, uh, but it really is uh, very, very important. I found that out uh, very early uh, when I uh, went to work for the Boeing company, my, my boss and mentor. Uh, we, we had some disagreements of, about uh, management styles and things like that. And uh, he was very, very big. Uh, and he was frustrated because he just didn't feel like the workforce uh, uh, was, uh, was listening to him. He says, Bob, I, I just don't understand it. Uh, you know, I, I come in every morning, he did. I, he, uh, he was the uh, VP in charge of the program. I uh, came in uh, six o'clock every morning, went to the employee's cafeteria and he said, I talk to those guys every morning. I said, boss, you gotta take your finger off the transmit button. I said, you know, it's, it's a two-way communication. You have to listen to what the, the folks are saying, not just transmit. And a uh, very, very important part of the, uh, of the program. So communication, a uh, very, very important part. One of the things we learned uh, as we were going through the different things is uh, to be able to deal with the unique scenarios, um, getting outside the shuttle, doing the spacewalk. Again, training in the neutral uh, buoyancy laboratory. 
Uh, this is a very, very unique, unique mission. I was actually Capcom for this mission, uh, where uh, the, we had uh, early in the program had deployed uh, two satellites, two commercial uh, satellites up there, about about five hundred million dollars per satellite. We put them in low Earth orbit. They're supposed to be a booster rocket. We take them up to a higher altitude. The ignition system for the booster rocket failed, and so we had deployed two worth a billion dollars worth of satellites that were just up there in a useless orbit. We couldn't use them. We figured out that we could, by changing out one component, uh, we could uh, go ahead and, and repair those, uh, those satellites and, and put them up into their higher orbit. So uh, the mission was to go up, uh, use the Canadian-built robotic arm, capture those satellites, bring them back inside the payload bay, change out that one component, put them back in orbit, and, and, uh, and save a, a billion dollars in the process. So we, we practiced that in the neutral buoyancy uh, laboratory uh, using the robotic arm, uh, had a satellite that was neutrally buoyant as well, and, and, uh, and everything worked just fine. We got up, we launched the mission, got up there on orbit, and as soon as that arm went out to capture that satellite, as soon as it touched the satellite, the satellite moved away. All right, all the engineers and scientists in the room, what did we forget? It worked fine when we did it in the neutral buoyancy laboratory. Viscosity of the water. In the water tank, there's just enough force of the water pushing back on the satellite that would stabilize it long enough to grapple it with the arm. In the void of space, the vacuum of space, no resistance, as soon as you touch it, it, it moved away. And it just points out that you know, sometimes we just weren't as smart as, uh, as we thought we were. Fortunately, uh, again, uh, uh, thinking on our feet, uh, if you will, uh, we, we devised a, a plan to fly the shuttle underneath. For the first time we, ever, we put three satellite, uh, spacewalking astronauts out in the payload bay, threw the shuttle directly underneath the uh, satellite, reached up with the gloved hands, grabbed that 8,000-pound satellite, pulled it back in the shuttle payload bay, and, uh, <laughs> and, and salvaged, uh, salvaged the mission. But again, uh, it, it drove us to, again, rethink how we were doing some things. It's really, really easy in that technical world to get you know, caught up and, and miss, over, overlook small things. So uh, attention to detail is very, very important. Getting ready for the flight, uh, once we got back on schedule, uh, some payloads uh, we took up. Our big payload on that uh, first mission, this is the one I can talk about. This was a tracking data relay satellite, a uh, big uh, uh, NASA communication satellite uh, they were putting up on orbit. And so we were, uh, as we were approaching um, uh, the, uh, the, the winter uh, season, we were, thought we were ready to go. Uh, we were doing a, a, a test of the orbiter on the pad, had a hydrogen leak in the main engine. Uh, first time we'd ever changed out one of the turbo pumps out actually on the shuttle pad. A very, very delicate operation. Points out something, too, that I always li like to uh, remind people of. Uh, my crew and I, the rest of us, uh, the 500 or so that actually got to fly in space, you know, we're the tip of the spear. Uh, we, we got to do the really exciting things, uh, and, and whatever accolades came of it, uh, I guess we got that. The, the really, uh, uh, heroes of the, the program were the thousands and thousands of people who worked on the program. And I always like to remember that uh, because it was it's through their efforts, their diligence, their concentration on making sure everything was right every time uh, that my crew and I were able to get safely to, uh, to orbit. Uh, nice, nice shot of the orbiter on the pad as we're uh, getting ready. Uh, very, very close to having uh, all those long hours. Uh, we spent a lot of time going down into the vehicle itself, doing testing uh, as we were uh, uh, preparing for that. Had gotten up about 3.30 in the morning for my uh, first launch, had a larger ceremonial breakfast. Um, and uh, again, ceremonial, some juice and coffee. Um, uh, and I would come to regret the coffee. Uh, haven't, uh, haven't mentioned uh, much about the families. Uh, an important part about it, uh, a couple of my children here that uh, are, uh, are out there with uh, signs in the, in the early morning uh, as we're getting ready to launch. But, but one of the things, uh, of course, try and, and main, keep the families as up to speed as you can doing it. But, but trust me, uh, when you're into this kind of a business with the, the kind of uh, things that are on the line, the lives that are on the line, there's a point in time where you just have to block that out and, uh, and go forward. It's kind of sad from that standpoint. I, I, you never neglect the families, but there's a point in time when you're sitting out there on the pan and uh, getting ready for launch, uh, you're certainly not thinking about it. Got dressed in our, uh, what we call our uh, uh, pumpkin suits, the uh, launch and entry suits. As I mentioned, uh, during the, up to the challenge accident, people launched in military style flight suits. Safe, uh, not very safe, but uh, certainly comfortable. Uh, once after we uh, got through the changes with Challenger, went to a full pressure suit. Uh, they're safe, but not comfortable, almost 100 pounds weight. Of course, you gotta remember the shuttle was vertical on the pad, so you're sitting on your back, very, very tightly strapped in, normally in that position for about two and a half hours before launch. Not so for my first flight, weather rolled in. If there's lightning within 25 miles of the uh, launch pad, you will not launch. And so my crew and I, we were 15 minutes away from launch when we got the call from the launch director. Said, uh, "Bad news, guys." And that's, you know, that's that's like your brain surgeon saying, "Whoops." You know, you really don't. It's not what you want to hear. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and so I said, uh, yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see if the weather clears. We waited, my crew and I spent six and a half hours on our backs in the launch pad. Remember those two cups of coffee? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really wish I had. Now, we do have a way of taking care, and this is a problem that has existed from the, uh, from the beginning of the program. Uh, even Al Shepard, actually, he had to go to the bathroom, and, and uh, what he wanted him to do was unbolt the hatch and let him out of the vehicle and, and go to the bathroom. Uh, they didn't want to break the continuity of it, and they finally resolved it with, with Al Shepard. Uh, the way they resolved the problem was to uh, go ahead and cut power uh, to the mercury capsule, and he basically urinated in the suit. Uncomfortable, but, but that's the way it happened. We've gotten uh, uh, a lot better uh, uh, over time. We, we use something I'm sure you're all familiar with, the MAGS, M-A-G-S. No? Maximum absorbency garments? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, adult diapers. So uh, you have the uh, you have the option of uh, of wearing a uh, an adult diaper uh, as you uh, as you go in there. I wish I had, uh, but uh, you know we all have our moments of pride. And I'll tell you what, the Marine Colonel fighter pilot was not about to launch on his first space mission wearing a diaper. So <laughs> I uh, that that was almost a uh, conclusion that I resented. All that finally came together uh, at uh, 20 seconds. Everything goes on the internal computers. Uh, Three seconds, six seconds before liftoff, the shuttle main engines ignite. That allows the te temperatures and pressures to stabilize. Inside the cockpit, you feel that whole stack sways at the, at the cockpit level. That whole five million pound stack sways 24 inches. When it comes back across top dead center, the computer sends a command, pulls the umbilicals, lights those solid rocket boosters, five million pounds of thrust. And again, inside the cockpit, your whole attention is riveted to those displays in front of you, looking for anything that would indicate an anomaly. Sure enough, uh, three minutes into the flight, we saw an indication uh, showed a power failure on one of our electrical buses. Notified Mission Control, confirmed the failure. I had got uh, authorization uh, to uh, bring up the backup system. In less time than it's taken me to tell you about it, we identified a potential problem, confirmed it with Mission Control, brought up the backup system, never missed a beat as we continue to accelerate at three times the force of gravity. So, uh, and got to remember, you're wearing a 100 pound suit, so that 100 pounds is now 300 pounds. So pretty fatiguing in there. Two minutes and 10 seconds in the flight, we do exhaust those, uh, the fuel and the solid rocket boosters. Again, they're jettisoned away. And then the ride smooths out, you're above the densest part of the Earth's atmosphere, and you continue on until you get to orbit. Jettison the external tank, and again, it burns up as it re-enters the atmosphere, and then we, uh, we start our, uh, in my case, uh, a five-day uh, five mission in space. So it's uh, goodbye Earth, hello space, uh, eight and a half minutes to get to orbit, so absolutely uh, dynamic. And you know, you get up there, um, you're, uh, they, they like you to stay in your seat for just a few minutes, make sure you're, you're not going to get sick or anything like that. Took the helmet off, get a breath of fresh air, uh, take your unstrap from your seat, float over the window. So 10 minutes after liftoff, I'm, I'm coming over the Middle East, and I look out the window, and, and it, the thought hits me. 10 minutes before that, I was on the coast at the Kennedy Space Center, sitting on top of my 184-foot spacecraft. Eight and a half minutes later, I'm traveling 25 times the speed of sound, 200 miles in Earth orbit, 10,000 miles from where I started. Absolutely incredible. And uh, as you can see, the view coming across the uh, uh, coast of Florida is absolutely incredible. Oh, we're very, very busy up there. We got out of those heavy launch and entry suits and, uh, and started our activities. First mission deploying this big tracking data relay satellite, a beautiful satellite, uh, still up there in orbit, by the way, after uh, over 26 years. Also, uh, one of the myths about the program, no, you cannot see the Great Wall of China with the, uh, with the naked eye from space. So uh, uh, big geographic features, uh, but not. A lot of experiments that we did up there. I, I'm not gonna go into any detail of the experiments. The things we did on the shuttle, five, 10 days in orbit, you're really not doing any real detailed science. You're doing precursors, proof of concept type things. Uh, this one was one we called Chicks in Space, actually sponsored by Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, waiting to see, uh, yeah, really, and, and uh, waiting to see whether uh, different uh, embryos in different stages of development would, uh, would hatch. And, and it was interesting because uh, there was a break point in there where uh, the launch acceleration or whatever changed the developmental cycle. And some of the eggs hatched, some did not. So uh, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, protein crystal growth experiment, one of the experiments that I did up there. Uh, again, proof of concept type things. I'll, I'll just stop on this one for a minute because it's uh, an interesting uh, uh, tie in to, uh, of course, the later on in the program, 2003, we had the, we lost Columbia and her crew. They'd been up on orbit. Uh, interesting enough, uh, although 
the spaceship was just spread over the, the better part of East Texas, uh, we were able to recover uh, some of the experiments and, and uh, the, uh, a, a experiment, a protein crystal growth experiment similar to the one I performed, actually able to uh, get enough of the material uh, to finish the experiment and, uh, and came up with a, uh, a breakthrough drug uh, uh, for, um, um, yeah, a breakthrough drug. I'm, I'm blocking on that. Did a lot of pictures uh, while we're up there, and um, some of them are really spectacular. Uh, points, if you recognize uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, uh, uh, taken from off the coast. Uh, <clears throat> the islands in the uh, uh, South Pacific, incredible beauty. I, I mean, and again, you're circumnavigating the globe every 90 minutes, 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of darkness. And, and you, most people don't realize it, but if you looked at the orbital plane of the shuttle, it's fixed. In, in inertial space, and the Earth is actually precessing and rotating underneath you. So you get to see some 70 to 80 percent of the Earth's surface while you're up there. And, uh, it's a shame we're so busy. I mean, you'd spend all your time looking out the window and, uh, and taking pictures of just the incredible, beautiful, uh, beautiful night shot. Uh, you can see uh, ap approaching uh, uh, daylight with the, uh, uh, the Earth glow in the background. Uh, of course, the boot, easily recognizable uh, boot of Italy. More points if you recognize this one. Uh, Nile, very good. Yeah, Nile River and, uh, and Cairo. And again, <clears throat> now we, we do a lot of the uh, pictures up from there. Uh, some of them that we bring back are actually quite useful for, uh, for science as some of the uh, meteorological studies and all that we're doing. We do have to eat while we're up there. Big improvement from the early days of the program when they squeeze baby food out of tubes. Still can't cook anything, so all the food is, is rehydratable or, or freeze-dried food. In this case, getting pretty sporty with some uh, uh, instant scrambled eggs. We can heat things up, uh, but there's no refrigeration either, so no fresh fruit or vegetables. But uh, uh, a well-balanced uh, meal and, and the ever-present hot sauce that uh, uh, we use up there. And you can see, although Velcro was not developed by the space program, extensive use of uh, Velcro. So you can see the Velcro holds the alligator clips in place. The alligator holds the tortilla. What holds the, the, the food on the uh, tortilla? Salsa. Hmm? Well, the salsa? Yeah, you're right. Fluid. As long as there's surface tension of fluid. That was my lesson for the, uh, for the youngsters. As long as, there's, as long as there's moisture in the food, it will cling together. So um, very important part. Sleeping up there is an absolute pleasure. And again, remember, you're weightless, whether you're right side up, upside down, sideways makes no difference at all. There is no gravitational vector. Uh, the funny arm position, that's just neutral body posture. It's where your muscles relax to in the weightlessness of space. Now, my commander is, is using a pillow, he's, and he's actually got it strapped to his head with a Velcro strap. I mean, again, you're floating up there. I can't, why would you use a pillow? And he, he just said it made him feel more comfortable. Actually, I like to free float to sleep. There's a handful of us that, uh, uh, that did, uh, the only problem with that is there is air current inside the shuttle and you may fall asleep in the front cockpit and end up in, in the aft. And, and if that bothers you, uh, uh, use, the, uh, uh, use the sleep restraints. Um, now, this is uh, uh, a lot of a, a time and attention uh, to personal hygiene up there. And, and it's one of the um, uh, more astounding, and it's one part of the flight that I didn't really uh, anticipate. You know, we spent so much time training for all the technical details, all the engineering aspects, all the science. And, and you don't, you knew you had to do the, the, the personal hygiene things and all like that, but it ended up, here you are in this $2 billion high-tech spacecraft, day-to-day -day life, personal hygiene, all that, uh, much more like a camping trip than, uh, uh, than a high-tech uh, space flight. And now, uh, the question that I most often get asked, and I've already been asked by the youngsters, uh, so how do you go up there? Quick lesson in human physiology, the good news is from the standpoint of the human body, your body performs in space just exactly the same way it does here on Earth. So eating, chewing, swallowing, digesting, eliminating, your body functions just fine up there. Kind of remarkable if you, uh, if you think about it. We're very, very adaptable. The problem is the facility itself, uh, our waste management system, um, uh, two different uh, functions, of course, urine collection, fecal collection. Uh, loss in the history of the program, the Department of Defense and NASA were actually partners early on with the loss of, uh, of Challenger. Uh, DOD pulled away, but we had a few uh, flights manifested. This was one of them. A highly classified mission, and uh, we're not going to talk uh, much about it. A beautiful uh, night launch, and if there's anything more spectacular than a day launch, it's a, uh, a night launch out of the Cape. Uh, uh, absolutely fascinating part of it. And because the uniqueness of the mission, it, uh, and because it was my second flight, a lot more time uh, to spend just looking out the window. And, and it, it's almost impossible to, to describe to you the, the beauty and the joy of, of, of looking out the window 
and seeing this magnificent planet that we live on and, and circumnavigating the globe every 90 minutes uh, and seeing sunrises and sunsets. This is my favorite uh, picture. It's a sunset from space. Uh, you realize you see that sunset every single time you orbit the planet. So every, every uh, 24 hours you're seeing 16 sunrises and sunsets. I do like to point out that uh, there's the limb of the Earth uh, bisecting the setting sun. That color spectrum in the background, that is the sunlight reflecting off the Earth's atmosphere. Believe it or not, what looks like on the screen up here, uh, about 10 inches in height, that is the 400,000 feet of sensible atmosphere that's out there. And I'll tell you what, all of us, astronauts and cosmonauts alike, uh, you know, we marvel at the beauty of this planet we live on, but you realize what a fragile environment it is and how we need to do everything we can to protect it. Coming back, uh, back to Earth, uh, uh, not quite as dramatic as the, uh, uh, the launch from the standpoint because we're just going to take that energy out and make a glided approach uh, entering the Earth's atmosphere or departing space out over the Indian Ocean and then falling until you start to enter that atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere uh, performs a useful function. It slows us down. Uh, and so what happens as the orbiter is coming into the atmosphere, uh, the friction of those air molecules impinging on the orbiter slows you down. It also heats up the plasma. Surface temperatures on the uh, outside of the orbiter are between 2800 and 3400 degrees Fahrenheit. Of course, we're protected inside by a thermal protection system. Little video shot of, uh, of what that looks like for, from inside the cockpit. Uh, the flashes are the reaction control system, jet, uh, system jets that we use to control our, uh, our descent as we come in. Again, maintaining a, uh, a constant attitude. Again, not as dynamic, not as many systems operating as you have during launch. During launch, everything has to be operating. At this point in time, no fuel. Uh, get a bit of an idea of that incredible um, uh, 21 and a half degree glide slope at 15,000 feet a minute. We do use a computer program to give us some guidance coming down. It's a little bit like a, a video game. You can see here on the left was the airspeed, on the right was the, uh, the altitude, and, and again, uh, entering the uh, uh, area over the Kennedy Space Center, uh, gliding to a landing. Pretty much uh, just a matter of keeping that dot centered in the circle and lining up the uh, overlay with the runway. Coming down very steeply again uh, until you get uh, to about uh, 2,500 feet at that point in time. Uh, you're going to stop your uh, really steep rate of descent, slowing from over 300 miles per hour in about uh, 10 seconds. Uh, the gear are going to come down and you're going to uh, touch down on the runway. We have the option of landing at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California, and on one occasion, for those that remember it, the third mission, uh, we actually landed Columbia out at uh, White Sands, New Mexico. And again, having practiced this uh, in the shuttle training aircraft, 100% uh, capable of putting it right down on the runway. Uh, and rolling out. Never had any real problems uh, uh, with the landing. One of the improvements we put in after the uh, Challenger was the uh, drag chute. Again, uh, you've got a 220,000 pound craft uh, landing at 200 miles per hour. For the physicists in the room, that's a whole lot of one half MB squared. So use the drag chute as our primary uh, deceleration device as we slow down. Now we don't uh, often get uh, individual accolades after a flight uh, uh, that uh, uh, DOD mission was, uh, was kind of unique, so uh, we had a chance. Anybody recognize the, uh, the, the other person? The one's me, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> the, the hair color has changed. Uh, that's the, uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Bill Webster, uh, director of the CIA, which will give you some clue as to what we might have been doing up there. So uh, uh, very, very, uh, very, very unique mission. It, it's, uh, it was very, very unique because the uh, vice president was there. They pinned the medal on. Uh, we were in a, in a secure facility when we got the award. They took the awards back, put them in a vault for five years. We couldn't even tell our, uh, our families that we'd received the, uh, uh, the recognition. Shuttle program, of course, has been uh, ended for some, almost six years now. We're still flying to the International Space Station. Incredible international laboratory up there in space. Uh, the size of a, a football field uh, up there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, and over 16 different uh, nations have contributed to design, developing, and operating the station. Uh, very, very close cooperation with the Russians. Uh, fantastic laboratory up there uh, and doing some incredible things. Uh, plant growth experiments uh, is one that's been very successful. And in fact, we're now growing uh, food, uh, bypassing uh, the, the need for refrigeration. We're actually growing lettuce and some other uh, vegetables on board the space station and, uh, and doing some uh, things with the LED lights. Uh, uh, that, uh, that you help to uh, uh, stabilize uh, some of our experiments as well as provide a, a, a better uh, sleep pattern. Of course, life on the space station is a little bit different. Uh, in my five days up there, I didn't have to worry about loss of, uh, of uh, muscle or bone density. Uh, but the people that are up there, as long as a year at a time, mandatory exercising two and a half hours a day, six days a week, in order to uh, minimize loss of muscle mass as well as uh, loss of bone density. Two and a half hours a day of exercise, and trust me, 
You sweat in space the same way you sweat on Earth. So at the end of your two and a half hours of exercise, you'd like to jump in and take a nice shower? Don't even think about it. There are no showers up there. Sponge bath. Now, that's not bad for five days, five months. Yeah, sponge gets, uh, baths get a little old. So a uh, variety of different type of, uh, of exercises that we can do up there. I'll, I'll pause on just one. We, we do have a treadmill uh, that, uh, that we have up there. And we had a treadmill on my first flight. You put on a harness with a bungee cord, keeps you attached to the treadmill. And I, I used to run marathons. So you follow me. We, we circumnavigate the globe for every, every 90 minutes. So if you stay on the treadmill for 90 minutes, I can literally say I've, I've run around the world. So. Uh, <laughs> How about the future? Uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, NASA has been a, a little bit uh, uh, low-key uh, since we ended the shuttle program. Again, still flying to the International Space Station, but using the Russian-built uh, Soyuz rocket to take American crews up there. The only two countries in the world that today can launch humans into Earth orbit, Russia and China. And so we're, we're working very diligently. Uh, NASA is working on something called the Space Launch System, uh, moving away from the reusable aspect of, of the, uh, the shuttle, going back to something more like the Saturn V uh, uh, Apollo and uh, using the Orion capsule uh, instead of the uh, reusable uh, orbiter. In addition to that, this may be the most exciting thing that's happening in the space program today, commercial space. I've, I've shown about a dozen different uh, companies up here. You've, you've got Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, who are investing their private, their personal uh, money into developing the next generation of, of spacecraft. And I, I think it's, uh, it's really exciting uh, uh, to see how that is developing and it continuing to expand. Again, there's over 20 different uh, private companies now uh, that are doing different concepts, but I think as we get uh, more and more people involved in. Think back to the early part of the, uh, of the 1900s uh, uh, when aviation was in its infant stages, uh, primarily the domain of the military and carrying the mail, and then we got to commercial aviation on board. That's when we saw the tremendous growth in, in aviation. I think we're on the cusp of, uh, of heading to that direction for the future. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, explore and expand. Uh, uh, right now, working in, in the near Earth space uh, aboard the space station, uh, hopefully, uh, perhaps going to the moon. Uh, I, I'm one that advocates uh, establishing a lunar colony, uh, but then uh, going to Mars, probably two decades uh, at the pace we're proceeding today, uh, unless one of those commercial companies can, uh, uh, can get out there. So we're keeping our eyes on the moon, but it's certainly looking in the distance uh, uh, to, uh, to Mars as we continue to build on the, uh, the fantastic uh, uh, experiences that we've had uh, learning about living and working in space and, uh, and continuing to, to challenge uh, the best and the brightest and to provide inspiration to our, our youngsters to, uh, to study uh, math and science as, uh, as we continue to explore. Well, thank you all very much. I really enjoyed the uh, opportunity to come here and talk to you about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank I you. hope I didn't disappoint. No. <laughs>